Um, our next speaker is from right here in San Diego, UCSD. Her name is Dr. Maya Kumar, and I'm not going to read her full bio, but in your folders, um, you, have your full you have her full bio that you can read. Um, but she's a board-certified pediatrician and adolescent medicine physician, um, and she specializes in treating people 10 to 20, ages 10 to 26. Um, and she has a special interest in adolescent sexual health and gynecologic care, um, and the importance of a trauma-informed and developmentally appropriate, appropriate approach to these sensitive issues. Um, so I will... Thanks so much, Lindsay. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. This is my first time getting to participate in this, in this conference. Um, so thank you so much for, for inviting me um, to meet you all and to talk a little bit about this subject today. Um, I want to just start with a couple disclosures, aside from the fact that like, I, don't, I don't have any money. <laughs> you know, I, mean, I don't have any like, sketchy connections or anything like that. But also, um, you know, I, I just want to put out there that like, I, am, I am not an expert on Jacobson syndrome. I want to be very, you know, some old deletions or translocations. I've had a lot of patients with genetic conditions, but I can't say that I have a specialized practice in young people with Jacobson syndrome. Um, that being said, I mean, my area of expert to be, but I'm not an expert on your children. You are the expert on your children, right? And so at the end of the day, these are just some, some things to maybe think about that you can then, you know, think about how you might approach things uniquely for your child. But I, I hope to just give you some ideas, and I'm around if people want to chat a little bit afterwards or discuss specifics. So um, I don't know if anyone watches Netflix. There's a, a really, there's a show that none of your children should watch called Big Mouth um, about a bunch of teenagers going through puberty. But one of the things I like about it is that a lot of their hormonal rage is personified with a hormone monster who makes a lot of inappropriate comments. But it's actually, it's not a bad representation <laughs> of what you imagine maybe, maybe kids might go through. Um, but I, I feel like, you know, when it, and I did a lot of learning about Jacobson syndrome in a very specific way to prepare for this presentation. Um, and w I just want to say how much respect I have for every you know, family member in this room, because when it comes to Jacobson syndrome, you and your kids have already been through quite a journey, no matter how old your kids are. Maybe your kids have had a lot of surgeries. Maybe your kids have had a lot of doctor's appointments. Maybe your kids have to take medications. Maybe you've had to you know, really learn in very unexpected ways all kinds of things about how your child learns, grows, copes, develops. I mean, this is hard for any parent, but you guys have had to make particular leaps and bounds to understand your child and help them to thrive. And it's like, just when you have everything figured out, puberty happens, and it's a bit of a game changer, right? So I just want to start by asking, of all the folks in the room here, who's got a child who's like under five? Okay, so like a lot of folks have a child under five. Um, what about like five to 10? Okay, you're, you're getting warmer. <laughs> what about uh, like over 10? Ding, 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 okay. <laughs> over 15? All right, no, that's awesome, yeah. So, you know, for some of you, you might be living this in real time. For others, I hope this might give you a sense of maybe some considerations to prepare for as your child gets older. But, I, I mean, I think those of you who are there already know that puberty may pose some potential extra challenges for kids who have chronic health conditions. First of all, I mean, and, and this might seem sort of obvious, but not all health conditions permit going through puberty in a, in a normal way, but kids with Jacobson syndrome do go through puberty, although their timing of puberty may be a little bit different than kids without this condition, and the degree of their growth spurt and the way they grow may be a little bit different, but the essential stages of puberty are essentially the same, so you can't escape. Um, I, I think that that's important just to keep in mind. Um, I think that one of the biggest challenges, though, is that their physical development goes at its own pace. And their physical development may progress faster than their social or emotional or intellectual development. And that discrepancy tends to potentially lead to some consequences. And some of you, either, even if you haven't experienced these consequences with your own child, you may be afraid of these consequences. 
And some of those consequences that I see in my practice are, first of all, significant distress, both in the child and their families, um, potentially unwanted pregnancy or sexually transmitted infections or HIV, unhealthy relationships, and probably most alarmingly, sexual victimization. Um, these are pretty serious outcomes, obviously. And it might, I, I feel like there's always going to be some people, especially if your kids are under five, where you're just like, whoa, things just got real, <laughs> real fast. You know, and, and it's okay if these are not things you were thinking about, you know, but I think it's important to know that you're going to have to think about it someday. And that day may come sooner than you realize. And the good news is there are ways that you and your child can be prepared for this and mitigate those potentially negative consequences. So my objectives today are to, first of all, by the end of this presentation, for you to be able to know if there's condition-specific things related to Jacobson syndrome that you need to know that will help you, you and your child prepare for puberty better. Um, things that are specific to Jacobson syndrome that are important to keep in mind. Um, secondly, to have a sense of what specific medical management, medical help, and reproductive health screening your child is going to need after they reach puberty, because you may need to be the one to advocate for this. Your pediatrician may not raise it first, because pediatricians are just as scared of puberty as everyone else. Like, I'll be honest about that, right? So you might have to be the one who actually raises this subject with your pediatrician. I wish that weren't true, but I, you know, I think it is a lot of the time. Um, begin discussions about puberty and normal sexuality with your child. Begin discussions to improve your child's sexual safety. These are the things that I'm hoping you'll be able to do, or at least feel comfortable thinking about, or at least not like vomit when you're thinking about when, you know, by the end of this presentation, right? So I want to start by talking a little bit about the brass tacks of puberty, like what actually happens. So, so I, I want to spend a few minutes talking more about just like physical development and how there might be some specific things in Jacobson syndrome that you should be aware of so that you can monitor how your child's puberty is progressing. So first of all, Jacobson syndrome kids may be more prone to certain endocrine abnormalities that could affect their growth and their puberty. One of them is you can be deficient in a hormone called IGF-1 or insulin-like growth factor 1. This is a hormone that is related to growth hormone and actually helps kids to grow taller. So it's very important in both boys and girls. But Jacobson syndrome appears to be associated with some degree of deficiency of this hormone, which means that many kids with Jacobson's may never reach higher than the 10th percentile on a growth curve. And I think that having that expectation and being able to maybe prepare your kid for that a little bit is kind of important because no matter who the kid is, no matter what their health condition is, every kid once they reach early adolescence, is comparing themselves to every other kid they know. Comparing their bodies, comparing their weights, comparing their shapes. And even if they're like average, you know, in, in that regard, they still think they're different. And kids with Jacobson syndrome might actually be different. And I think it's important to prepare your kids. And, and, and not to say those differences are, are bad, you know, but, that, but there might be differences. And that all kids, regardless of their health condition, go through puberty in different ways. And that's not unique to Jacobson syndrome, but that's an important thing to understand. And you might need to start having conversations like that about, you know, with your kids. The second thing is that Jacobson syndrome may carry a higher risk of hypothyroidism or inactive thyroid. Um, I'm just curious, does anyone here already have a child with hypothyroidism? Okay, so a few people. So hypothyroidism can do a couple of wacky things with puberty. The first thing is it can either delay the onset of puberty, but the second thing is it could actually make you go into puberty too early. So neither of those things are necessarily good. You know, early puberty, first of all, they, you might be missing out on critical developmental events and time is marching on and you're not actually progressing the way you should. Um, but early puberty might actually lead to closing of your growth plates before your child was supposed to have them close and even more height stunting than what they were supposed to have. So we're going to talk a little bit more about the timing of puberty in a bit, but just keep in mind that if your kid has hypothyroidism, be aware that that could potentially influence the timing of puberty if it's not well controlled. And also, 
even if you don't think your kid has hypothyroidism, if their puberty is not starting at a typical time, you might want to get them checked for hypothyroidism. You know, so I think that these are all important things to remember. Um, thirdly, boys with Jacobson syndrome may be more prone to having undescended testicles or hypogonadism when they're born. Who had a boy with undescended testicles? Okay, so we have a few in the audience. So an important thing to know is boys who are born with undescended testicles, regardless of the reason, whether it just sort of happened or it was associated with a genetic condition, are more likely to develop testicular cancer. And even if that testicle was brought down and surgically corrected, you know, fairly early on, that risk is still elevated for that child. So it is very important for young men with a history of undescended testicles to learn how to do self-testicular exam as early as possible. Now, in a standard way, it's typically, you know, for most healthy young men, it's introduced around age 15. But honestly, I, I start that conversation earlier, around age 12 or 13, to teach boys during like their physicals and stuff like that how to do self-testicular exams. And this is something, for those of you who have teenage sons who may have this history, very important to have a conversation with them about that. The good news is that testicular cancer is very, very treatable, but only if it's detected early. And so if no one is having a look down there, you know, things could be going undetected and that could be pretty serious. So very important to make your pediatrician talk to the, your, your kid about that and to maybe initiate those conversations at home as well. Um, so those are a few specific things that hormonally that might affect puberty with Jacobson syndrome. The other thing that we have to talk about is Paris Trousseau, or platelet dysfunction, and how that can result in some pretty significant menstrual difficulties for young women once they start getting periods for the first time. It is very likely, if they have platelet dysfunction, that their periods are going to be prolonged, so longer than they should be, and very heavy and or very painful. Aside from the fact that that's just not fun, that creates a number of other difficulties too. So, first of all, when, when I say heavy periods, what I mean by that is a period that lasts longer than seven days. Um, if, a, if a girl is having to use more than six pads in one day, or if they're having to change their pad or tampon once every one to two hours. Another question I sometimes ask kids is if they have to double up, if they have to use both a tampon and a pad at the same time, um, because that's, again, a sign that, well, I mean, their, their bleeding is pretty heavy. It's hard, it's hard to keep up with. Um, so they're more prone to having these heavy periods, but you know, that can create hygiene difficulties. That can create, I've had a lot of parents tell me how hard it is if their kid is at school all day, that it's, it's really hard to get teachers or aides to help their daughters with their hygiene and with their toileting. And the girls may struggle to do this on their own. So depending on the kid, that, that could be a challenge. Um, I've, I've actually had some parents say that their teachers just refuse to help or their age just refuse to help with any menstrual hygiene at all. So they won't help with like changing pads or things like that. And I've had a few kids, this is not specific to Jacobson syndrome, just kids with bleeding disorders um, and you know, um, developmental conditions where they just had to put their kids back in diapers because there, there was no help available for their girls at school. And obviously that you know, is not ideal at all, right? So I mean, having these conversations ahead of time how are we going to manage that is really important. Um, imagine that you get painful periods, not just heavy periods, and then your ability to communicate this is limited. That makes for a not good situation. And I have a, a lot of parents who bring their kids in and say, you know, around you know, a certain time every month, my kid is just cranky, they're miserable, like nothing we do is right, they're really upset, they're you know, they just, they're very, very, like, it's like we're walking on eggshells around them. And it's, as we kind of discussed it more, it turns out that this is how this poor girl is living her, out her menstrual cramps. And she's not really able to necessarily communicate or, you know, understand why she feels so terrible. And, you know, that's really frustrating for kids. Um, the other thing is, aside from just cramps, the hormonal changes that are involved during menstrual cycles can actually create seizures and behavioral changes in kids who are prone to this to begin with. So I'm, I'm just curious, anybody here has a daughter with a seizure disorder? 
Okay. So something to be prepared for is that sometimes seizure disorders will get worse at certain stages in the menstrual cycle. How old is your daughter? She's eight. Okay. So this is something to watch as she gets older. If you're noticing her seizures seem like they're getting worse, and there almost seems to be a cyclic nature to it, it may actually be related to ovulation, which sucks. But something, there is help, okay? But yes, <laughs> we're going to talk about the help later. But I just want to give you a sense of like things to look out for. And so that particular type of seizure is called catamenial epilepsy. Catamenial is just a Latin word, means like relating to periods kind of a thing. But catamenial epilepsy is specifically seizures that get worse depending on your, you know, where you are in your menstrual cycle. So that's something to be watchful of. Um, I think that the last thing that's important is sometimes just, even if it, if it doesn't necessarily create pain, even if it doesn't necessarily create specific behavioral issues or, you know, just changes in mood, it can often create a lot of distress if the kid just doesn't necessarily understand what's happening to them and doesn't understand how to, it doesn't really have good ways to cope with it. Um, I've had parents tell me their child is like smearing blood on the walls, is, um, you know, just really can't tolerate a pad against their skin. Um, I've had a couple kids who, who eat their pads um, because they, they just don't know. And, you know, this, it's really hard for them to, to cope. So uh, there's an enormous amount of emotional distress that can go along with periods if the kid and or the, you know, the family is not prepared. And sometimes even if you are prepared, these things still happen. I do want to reassure you that, because here's, here's what I find. A lot of kids and families just suffer through it. They're, they're just like, okay, you know, she reached her first period, and I guess her life is just going to be miserable once a month. And I just want to warn you, it doesn't have to be like that. I'm surprised often when people finally come in to see me as like a, you know, reproductive health person, like how long they've been suffering. And there are medications and other things that can really, really help improve quality of life. So the, you know, silver lining in all of this is that there are good treatments available if you have a daughter with Jacobson syndrome or who has a, you know, platelet dysfunction or, or bleeding tendency, but you just need to tell your doctor about it and ask for the help. And if they don't know how to help you, Tell them to refer you to me <laughs> or, or a gynecologist, right, uh, or a pediatric gynecologist or an adolescent medicine provider because there's actually lots and lots and lots of things that can be done to help. We're going to talk about some of those options a little bit later. So as someone mentioned earlier, there is a difference between the breast tax, so just like the, the mechanical changes of puberty, and also sexuality, which is an even scarier thought, you know, for, for many of us, right? But I think... There's a few things that are important to know. Youth with Jacobson syndrome are able to reproduce. I heard some gasps. It is true. And although we don't have a lot of studies for Jacobson syndrome specifically, there are lots of studies for other types of genetic syndromes and chromosome deletion syndromes. And kids who have these, at least for the other conditions, they still experience sexual desire and they still have consensual sexual relationships as young adults. Like, no one is making eye contact right now. And, you know, and I know this is, this is a really, really difficult thing to, to think about, but it's, it's a reality that I think as, as parents and, and relatives, you gotta be prepared for and prepare your child to keep themselves safe and make smart decisions. So you have to assume at some point your child is going to have a sexual identity as any other child eventually will. And it's not easy for any adolescent, but there's a lot of research that suggests that kids with chronic health conditions receive much less preparation than kids who don't have those chronic health conditions and they actually experience worse consequences because of that. So this is not specific to Jacobson syndrome at all, but there are studies looking at young adults and adolescents who have mild to moderate intellectual disabilities or developmental disabilities and looking at their outcomes in young adulthood. Um, there was one very large study that was published recently, just this year, that if you're looking at young people by age 19 to 20 who have mild to moderate intellectual disabilities, so this would be an IQ of less than 85, that's how they defined it in this particular study, 
but about 75% had already had sex, at least once, 60% had unprotected sex, about a quarter to a third of them usually had unprotected sex, about 50% of women had been pregnant already, at least once, um, which was more than double the number of women who did not have an intellectual disability. And I think there's really complex reasons for these scary numbers. I mean, first of all, as we talked about, there can be a mismatch between your physical development and your so social and emotional development. Um, and people may not necessarily understand things to the same degree. I, I mean, unfortunately, I have a lot of scary stories, so I'm going to share one of them. So I had a young woman who, um, this was a few years ago, but at the time she was 17. And when she was like seven or eight years old, she'd had a brain tumor. And so this had been removed surgically and she'd had chemotherapy and radiation and um, you know, all of those things. And she was left with a mild to moderate intellectual disability. But puberty happened the same time it would have happened anyway. Um, I think that her mother thought that because she was so childlike in so many other ways that she wasn't interested or ready to learn about sexual health. Um, but she still noticed boys and would talk about them and you know, would have little crushes and things like that. And I think the mom thought, oh, well, it's innocent, it's cute. You know. um, she started going on Facebook, and she, this is when Facebook was just kind of getting started. And she started talking to, making new friends online and including male friends. And one day, she was coming to see me for an appointment and started talking to me about this, her new boyfriend, who is this boy that she met on Facebook. And she talked about how um, they had gone on their first date and they had met in a park near her home. And I started asking her more questions and it turns out this young woman had been sexually assaulted. And I mean, she had no idea. She thought it was her boyfriend. And this is just what you do with your boyfriend. So, and I've had other kids like that, same situation. They have not been prepared, but they still have feelings. They still have desires. And she didn't understand the position that she had been in. I ended up having to call Child Protective Services. You know, it was, and this poor kid, even, even after all that, just ended up being confused just confused, unaware of what had really happened to her. I mean, obviously her family was devastated. I mean, there, you can imagine the chain of events that went off you know, at this point. But this is why you have to be prepared. This is why every kid has to be prepared to understand what a healthy relationship is, to understand what good touch and bad touch is, to understand what consent is. It doesn't matter what your kid's stage of development is. They have to know these things. If their physical development has progressed, they have to be ready. And I know that sounds like a tall order, but it can be done. You just have to be willing to do it. And we'll talk more about how you know, in a few minutes. I think that part of the reason that, that might, they might be unprepared is because a lot of the time, these kids, just like the girl I was just describing, are often considered sort of asexual or you know, just vulnerable, you know, it's like, oh, well, that, that's not gonna be, no one's gonna you know, proposition them, or you know, they're not gonna go to a dance, or like, you know, things like that, but there's a lot of evidence talking about how wrong parents and providers can be about their assumptions about their children. They receive less sexual education from their parents, from their teachers, and from their pediatricians. This is well documented. And they may also have less of an understanding of sort of normative behavior. I had another patient recently, um, let's see, he was about 17 years old, and he'd recently started taking the bus by himself, like taking like the, the public bus. And he got kicked off the bus because he was touching himself. And I don't think he realized that that would necessarily, you know, like what the other people would think, you know, how that would seem to other people. All he knew is that suddenly the bus driver started yelling at him, he got kicked off this bus, he had no idea what was going on. He, as he's telling me this, he was just in tears. And this poor kid, like, just felt, now he never wants to take the bus again, you know? And I mean, I, I think this is why, like, having those conversations are, are so important. So you can, you know, really get people prepared about what's appropriate and what's not, so that they don't get into trouble inadvertently. I had another patient who, again, didn't understand kind of like the whole concept of 
good touch, bad touch, and your private parts and stuff like that. And he got in serious trouble for touching another girl at school on the breast. He really didn't know he was doing anything wrong. He really didn't. But suddenly, the whole school is up in arms against this child who was actually just totally unaware that he was doing anything wrong. Um, incredibly traumatic for this young man and for his family. So these are really important things to be thinking about as your kids get older. I think that even though you know, your kids may not be developing typically, the one thing that, that does happen in adolescence, no matter when you start adolescence, and I have patients who are 25 and just starting adolescence, right? It really, it depends on you know, just when it happens for you. But that desire to fit in, to be normal, to be accepted by your peers is so strong and so powerful. And I'm not just talking about sexuality, but like all of our kids are gonna go through that, no matter what their health condition is. There's gonna be part of them that is aware that they're different and feels weird about it. And sometimes that feeling leads you to put yourself out there in ways that you might not otherwise. And that's true when it comes to substance use, that's true when it comes to sexuality, and that's a very big contributor to why sexual abuse is so much more common in kids who have chronic health conditions and kids who have intellectual disabilities. The last point I want to mention and this, this might be the scariest thought of all, is that many kids with chronic health conditions or genetic conditions think a lot about wanting to be a parent and think a lot about the legacy they eventually want to have. And they may not respond well to the idea of people just assuming it's not going to happen for them. And I've had kids intentionally try to get pregnant because they want to experience parenthood. They may not really understand what that is, they may not really understand the responsibilities that are involved, but not all of pregnancies that occur in you know, people with chronic health conditions are unwanted. I've had several patients with Down syndrome who have actively talked about how they want to have a baby even when they're 16 or 17 years old because they love babies and they want someone to love and they want to be a mom. So, that's a tough one, right? Yeah. But they might be having these feelings or these questions. And the only way to find out about it is to ask and to talk about it. I've already alluded quite a bit to how much more vulnerable kids with intellectual disabilities or chronic health conditions are. They have significantly higher rates of sexual abuse. I read one statistic recently from a paper um, I didn't put it up here, but that by age 18, about 70% of girls with a severe intellectual disability have experienced sexual abuse. And that is probably an underestimate because of how often it can't be communicated. Um, and, and that's a terrifying thought, but it is unfortunately the world we live in. And I, I, I want to just give you a little bit of information here. This was published by the U.S. Department of Justice recently. But just in general, men and women with intellectual disabilities are about seven times as likely to be sexually abused. And women in particular are 12 times as likely to be sexually abused compared to their, their counterparts. There's so many reasons for this. We, we socialize kids with chronic health conditions and with developmental disabilities to be compliant. We socialize them to listen to authority figures. Do what your teacher says, do what your mom says. And when mom and dad isn't there anymore, you're gonna do what the caregiver at your um, you know, adult living home says. You do what people say. That is what we train young people to do. That's what we praise them when they do. You know, and I, I think that we have to think about the implications of that a little bit. They may already have a very limited understanding of sex or sexual consent and what might even be happening to them if something wrong is happening. They may have multiple caregivers who take care of them and attend to even personal needs like toileting and dressing and changing and things like that. Um, they may not be able to talk about it or escape from the situation even if they're aware that something uncomfortable is happening. And I, I think this is very, very important. Doctors don't talk about this with their patients. We should, we should, but it doesn't happen enough. Okay, 
So that was all the scary stuff. So now I want to talk about solutions. There are solutions. There are things all of us can do. There's things your providers can do. There's things you as parents can do. And so that's the part that I want to focus on you know, for the rest of my speaking time is what we can actually do. The first thing that's important to do, and this is something to start thinking about when your kid is even under five, but start setting realistic expectations about growth and puberty. Help your kids to understand their bodies. This is a critically important thing, because if you don't even have the words, how on earth could you talk about it if something was, had gone wrong or if something had made you uncomfortable? You, your kid needs to know the words. So first of all, especially for Jacobson syndrome, set realistic expectations for adult height. You don't want them constantly comparing themselves to other kids and setting unrealistic expectations up for themselves that make them feel bad or make them feel disappointed. I think that that's imp an important conversation to have. Talk about normal changes in your body for both boys and girls before they happen so that they know what to expect and they're not alarmed when it happens. So for girls, you want to talk about how they may start to get some swelling or increase in their breast size and that sometimes it hurts a little bit. You want to talk a little bit about developing armpit hair and developing pubic hair. You want to talk about developing body odor and developing acne. Um, for boys, you want to talk about genital and penile growth. And you want to talk about the growth spurt, how their clothes are not necessarily going to be fitting anymore. They're going to be outgrowing their clothes pretty quickly. And particularly for girls, you want to tell them that an increase in your percentage body fat is normal. You are not just gaining weight. You are going through puberty. This is a very common thing I get kids coming, like kids of, of all backgrounds, typically developing kids, kids with chronic health conditions, they're often coming in and they, they're very aware that their weight has gone up or that their body composition has changed and they're petrified that they're losing weight and some of them have already started dieting. So, I mean, I think that that's a really important thing to, to prepare kids for, that you are normal and healthy. Show them their growth curves and show them how they're staying nicely on their growth curves. And growth curves are not a flat line, they increase, right, for both height and weight. I think that that, that visual really helps kids. I, I, pretty routinely show kids their, their growth curves when I see them in clinic. Um, so we talked about that. And I think that the, the, the real take home message is that it's not just them. Every single kid is gonna go through puberty at a different pace and everyone is an individual. So that, that is a really important message. Um, this might seem like kind of a lame analogy, but it sort of works for, for kids, and I, I have found this useful in explaining this to kids, is, you know, I ask them, do you like dogs? You know, and, and I say, you know how there's like different kinds of dogs? There's like, there's little Shih Tzus, and then there's like German Shepherds and things like that. And, you know, if, if I had a Shih Tzu that was, or sorry, if I had a German Shepherd that weighed as much as a Shih Tzu, or if I had a German Shepherd that only grew as long as a Shih Tzu, that would be a pretty sick German Shepherd. You know, so you, you need to kind of, understand what kind of dog you are, and just be the healthiest you can be for that kind of dog. Usually I get a little chuckle from kids, but, but they get it. They get that not all dogs look the same, and not all people look the same, or have the same weight and shape and build and stuff like that. And you gotta sort of get familiar what kind of dog you are and embrace it. Just be the healthiest German Shepherd you can be, you know. Um, I, I find that is a, a useful analogy for talking to kids about that. Anatomic terms are critically important to start using early. People need to know what's down there and what it's called. Um, and I think that that's really important, not only for their own reproductive health screening, but also it's been shown that kids who know their anatomy and can use those words are more able to talk about if they've been hurt or abused or manipulated because they can say what happened. And I think that, that th giving them those words is actually really important. The next thing to think about is whether you think puberty is proceeding normally for your kid. Because as I mentioned, your doctor may or may not notice. So it's very important to sort of be on the lookout and ask if you are wondering if puberty is not actually developing normally. Girls typically begin breast development between eight and 13 years old. So for those of you who have under 10 year olds, your kids may well already be in puberty. 
And breast development is the first sign of pubertal development in girls. So, and there's, there's a, quite a wide range for when it happens, but if your daughter is younger than eight or older than 13 and has not yet had breast development, you should probably check in with your doctor about that. Um, girls generally have their first period by the time they're 16. So if your daughter is past 16, still hasn't had her first period, that is also something to talk to your doctor about. And remember, some things to think about are thyroid disease, potentially other endocrine abnormalities. They may need to have a workup to make sure that they're not just a late bloomer, but that you know, they might actually have something that needs to be treated. For boys, testicular development is the first thing that changes. And you might also start to see pubic hair developing around this time. And that can happen anywhere from age 9 to 14 years. So if your kid is 14 and there's like nothing happening down there, you should probably get them to see their doctor. Or if they're younger than nine and things are already happening, you should probably get them checked out as well. Um, a lot of boys ask me when they're going to start shaving and when they're going to start having their voice change and stuff like that. And, you know, I think that it's often unclear, like, when that happens. I think it's important to know that that tends to be a late finding. You know, it's actually one of the last things that happens in puberty for, for boys. So you may be in puberty for a few years before your voice changes and before you actually start needing to, to shave, you know, other than like on your birthday or whatever, right? So um, just keeping that in mind that it's, it's okay. If they, as long as they've started puberty, it's okay if they're not necessarily shaving or having voice changes yet. Um, I think that it's very important to, to normalize that they are, well, I mean, when they're the right age, right? That, that they are sexual beings. I think denying it is not necessarily the best strategy. Acknowledging it allows you to control the discussion. And I think that then you can actually have a conversation about mutual respect and how to stay safe. Masturbation happens to almost every kid. And again, rather than denying it, I think it's important to set appropriate boundaries. So for example, your private area is something that you should just never touch unless you are in your bedroom or your bathroom doesn't matter why you're touching yourself, just in general. You should never touch your private area. It's a social thing, because it might offend people or bother people or scare people. You should never touch yourself unless you're in your bedroom or your bathroom and you're by yourself. You know, so you can keep it very concrete. But these are like examples of things that you can be teaching your kids from, from early on. Um, I think that healthy relationships may be more important to discuss than sex. I had a young lady with Down syndrome who was saying that she was, she was upset because she had some male friends who were always trying to touch her, were always trying to like hug her and like touch her hand and stuff like that. And she just said like, I don't like it, like I'm not into it. It was hard for her to necessarily go into why, but she was certainly feeling like her personal space was sort of being invaded, but she didn't want to hurt their feelings. So she didn't really know how to say anything to them. So one thing that we talked about is, can you say, um, hey, can we high five instead? And that was something that ended up working really well for her. So you know, when, whenever her male friends would kind of want to hug her and stuff, she would be able to kind of stop them and say, actually, can we high five instead? And that actually ended up going pretty well. So you might have to practice with them and discuss alternatives. But talking about how you, no one can touch you and you can't touch anyone else unless you've asked for permission. I often encourage parents, like right from day one, for, for any kind of contact at all, even with family members and friends and stuff like that, to, to just sort of think about asking for permission. So for example, um, to ask, hey, can I give you a hug? You know, and uh, that might seem silly. Maybe I'm not saying necessarily between like a mother and their child or something, right? But like, you know, if a family friend comes over or, you know, even when they're with their little friends and stuff like that, but just to ingrain in them from day one, if you're going to have any personal contact with anyone, ask them for permission. Make sure it's cool, you know. Um, and talk about what types of contact might be okay all the time. Like generally, for most people, shaking hands is a pretty reasonable thing to do, you know, no, even if you don't know that person. But then for other stuff, you probably want to ask for permission. You know what I mean? So things like that, they're very concrete. But it sets things up later because if they know how to ask for a hug and expect to be asked for hugs, they're much less likely to feel uncomfortable or allow, you know, 
other physical touching that's more scary or more bothersome to happen because they're going to have it in their minds already. No, people are supposed to ask for permission. This is not okay. You know, and I think that that's a very important concept to start talking about very, very early. Um, introduce the idea of romance and friendship and companionship. Because I think that a lot of discussions about sex are just about sex. And a lot of the time, when kids experiment sexually, that's not actually what they're looking for. They're looking for companionship. Or they're looking for friendship and to, to feel close to somebody. And I think it's important to tell people there's lots and lots of ways that you can experience that or express that. And you don't necessarily have to use your body to do it. But to, to talk about how it's normal to have those feelings, to want to be close to someone, and then healthy and safe and appropriate ways of expressing that, I think is really important. And even if they never ever use them, they need to know what condoms are. They need to know that you can get infections if your genitals touch another person's genitals. They need to know that they could get pregnant or get someone pregnant. They need to know that birth control is a thing and that pregnancy prevention is a thing. Again, even if they never ever have to use them, you know, but they need to know it exists. And make their doctors talk to them about it. <laughs> that is also very important. Um, I think it's helpful also and kind of makes it less scary to not just talk about the machinery with them, but also talk about the maintenance requirements a little bit. You know, what kind of health care should they expect they need to have once they have, you know, reproductive parts that work? So first of all, I would prepare them that doctors may start doing genital exams at physicals. So they're not afraid when it actually happens. And I, because, you know, for some young men, for example, your doctor might be the one who identifies, hey, there's a lump on this testicle, right? And so you, your doctor has to actually be able to do the exam. But it's important to set boundaries of like only the doctor, not some other random person kind of a thing, right? But like just establishing that that is a, an important part of healthcare is, is getting your reproductive organs checked. So that's important. Um, young women who have had any kind of sexual contact whatsoever, even if they've never had vaginal intercourse, but if they've had oral sex or anything involving fingers or anything like that, they still need to get pap testing when they're 21 years old and every three years afterwards. And so that's very important for cervical health. Um, I do have a lot of patients with intellectual disabilities who engage in different types of sexual activity, even if they're not having vaginal intercourse. And so they need to know that they still need to get the periodic screening required to keep their cervix healthy. Um, breast examination, regardless of your sexual experience, should begin at age 20 for all women. This is assuming you don't have a concerning family history or anything like that, but I'm talking about like a general case scenario. It should start at age 20 and then happen at least once a year. So preparing young women for that. Um, Self-testicular exam, as we've already alluded to, by around 15, boys should be kind of knowing how to do that, knowing what to look for. And for you guys, if you want to start talking to your kids about it, what you're really looking for is any kind of, the, the surface of the testicle should feel like an egg. It should be smooth. There shouldn't be any bumps or ridges. If there are bumps or ridges, then you want to have your doctor look at that and maybe get an ultrasound to make sure that everything is okay. I would also recommend very strongly, even if you're not sure your child is ever going to have any kind of sexual relationship whatsoever, to strongly consider HPV or human papillomavirus vaccination for your kids. This is a vaccine that's normally routinely recommended at age 11 and 12. But I have a lot of parents whose kids have chronic health conditions who assume their child is not going to have any kind of sexual contact. This is an awful thought. But just because they don't have any wanted sexual contact does not mean they're not going to have any sexual contact. And so the question is, do you want them to have that protection? And if it was me, I would, I would vaccinate them anyway. So I mean, especially because it's such a low risk vaccine. So it is something to think about. A lot of you guys aren't there yet. Don't worry about it until they're like 11 or 12. And even if you vaccinate before age 14, that's when the vaccine is most effective. If people have questions about HPV vaccine, I'm happy to answer them. I don't work for Merck or anything like that. I just really believe in this vaccine because I've seen it save lives, but just something to consider. Um, and ask your doctor if periods are interfering with quality of life. 
or if, if puberty is interfering with quality of life. Because like I said, you don't have to live like that. You don't have to just suffer with really heavy or painful or uncomfortable periods. Um, I think that one question I often get from families is, can we just not let puberty happen at all? Can we just not let it happen? Or can we actually consider surgery to remove their sexual organs? Or, you know, it's not uncommon for me to get questions and sometimes just requests um, for, for that. And I understand why people ask those questions and why people ask for that because sometimes they've gone to hell and back trying to help their kid get through puberty. Um, but at the same time, it's important to explain that your sexual development is important for more than just your reproduction. For example, estrogen has a critical role in bone health and cardiovascular health. Testosterone has a critical role in um, brain development, energy, um, you know, intellect and you know, alertness. Um, people don't feel well if they're supposed to have estrogen or testosterone and they don't. You know, so I think talking about how these hormones actually do a lot of really important things in your body, even if you're, you're not thinking your child is necessarily going to have a consensual sex life, that doesn't necessarily mean you want to just take those organs out altogether or not allow them to develop. So the goal is to allow normal development, but while minimizing the impact on the quality of life. Um, and I usually tell people, because I sometimes get pre-pubertal consults. I have parents bring their kids in when they're like eight or nine. Breast development has started, and the parent is already kind of thinking ahead and being like, maybe we should just stop this right now. And I usually tell them, I would advise that you give this some time. When they have their first period, see how it goes, and then come see me. This doesn't mean you have to suffer through years and years and years of awful periods, but Let's see how it goes. And your kid may tolerate it better than we expect, right? I think it's important to give them a chance, too. If the periods are really difficult to manage, if they're painful or they're very heavy, um, the most common reason that I use birth control in adolescents and young adults is actually for menstrual control as opposed to pregnancy prevention. And so these medications are actually incredibly safe and effective in reducing menstrual flow and maybe even letting the child skip periods or not have periods. So one option is kind of standard birth control pills. The same medicine, if your child doesn't swallow pills, is available in a patch that you put on your skin and change once a week, or a vaginal ring that, you know, if you have an experienced teenager who's like able to put in a tampon, then this would be, you know, another way you could deliver the same medicine. But it allows your periods to become shorter, lighter, more predictable, and less painful. And there's some other perks, like it reduces acne, it reduces your risk of ovarian and uterine and colon cancer over time. So, you know, it's, it's, they're quite safe medicines to use, and they, they often make a very big difference in terms of people's quality of life. Um, for people who have catamenial epilepsy or people who have other health conditions that are worsened at certain stages of your menstrual cycle, these medicines inhibit ovulation. So very often it's recommended as a treatment, for example, for worsening of seizures because they do inhibit ovulation. Um, it often helps a great deal with mood, if that's a problem for your daughter. Um, so these are just things to consider. There are very few medical reasons why a person could not be on these medicines. Um, one of them would be if they have a history, a personal history of blood clots. Usually kids almost have the opposite problem. They bleed too easily as opposed to clotting too easily. Um, and other rare conditions that your doctor will probably ask you about just to make sure it's safe for them, but it's safe for most people. Um, there are other options available too. There's an injection that you can give your daughter once every 12 weeks that also suppresses ovulation. The nice thing about the shot is that over time, most women actually stop having periods and that's actually perfectly safe. It's not that the blood is building up with nowhere to go, the blood just doesn't build up in the first place. So it's very safe to use these medications for menstrual suppression. And many people with bleeding disorders, I would say that Depo-Provera, the injection, is probably their go-to. Because if they don't swallow pills or they just don't want to have periods at all, then, you know, this is a really good option. Um, a couple things to just be aware of is that they can make you a little more hungry. So if your child struggles with maintaining their weight, that might be something to just kind of think about. Um, the other thing is they can decrease bone density if you're using it for years and years and years. 
So for kids who need menstrual suppression long term, another option to consider is an intrauterine device. So for kids who are not developing typically and you don't think they could tolerate an office procedure to insert an intrauterine device, which is you know, the case for many kids in this situation, it can be done in an operating room under sedation. It, I've had patients who I sent to do it even under general anesthesia. And once it's in, it lasts for up to seven years. There's no medications to take. There's no prescriptions to pick up or doctor's appointments or anything like that. It provides a fairly effective menstrual suppression. So a lot more work on the front end, but you know, it's long acting. It doesn't have any effect on weight or bones or anything like that. So it is an option worth considering. And I, I often have patients who transition from Depo Provera to an IUD when they're like 18 to 25 kind of a thing. Um, so it's something just to kind of consider. When it comes to sexual safety, I would say that it's never too early to start having those conversations with people about what anatomic terms are, about the difference between good touch and bad touch, who can see their private areas, and sort of healthy relationships. I had a young man recently who was like 20, and you know he had cerebral palsy, he had a moderate intellectual disability, um, living with his aunt and uncle, lovely, lovely guy. Um, he had a girlfriend who was also like 19 or 20 and also had cerebral palsy, and they were talking about becoming sexually active, but they needed a lot of education, and he was just so, he, what he talked about is he actually felt like she was pressuring him more than he wanted to. And so we talked a little bit about how, you know, expressing yourself with your body has to be something that you're both ready for. You should always ask for permission. There are, you know, you don't necessarily have to jump to sex in order to express your love to the other person. So we actually, and you know, we had a really good conversation. He actually brought his girlfriend in. It was super cute because they both used um, they were both wheelchair bound and they both came in, um, you know, on MTS, they caught the bus together, they came over and we had this great conversation about how maybe things in their relationship they needed to think about in terms of being honest with each other, not doing anything the other person doesn't want before they actually think about having sex. And I think they were very receptive to that. So, you know, it ended up being a really positive thing. I would strongly suggest that you supervise or limit their social media use and their screen time thinking about that example I mentioned earlier about the young woman who met an inappropriate person on Facebook. But if you don't have, if your kid is on social media and you don't have the passwords, get the passwords. And make sure that you are doing spot checks of their social media use, know who they're talking to. I think there should be, in general, a house rule that you shouldn't have any online friends that you haven't met in person and that your parents haven't met in person. I recently had the misfortune of having to get involved with, a, or having to involve the FBI cyber crimes unit in a the case of a patient of mine who was actually being groomed online by some people who were not good people. Um, and unfortunately, I learned through that experience with, with you know, speaking to the FBI how commonly this happens without families knowing about it. So if you're not doing spot checks, start doing spot checks. It's really, really important. Um, I think that every kid should know about emergency contraception, which does not cause abortion but it just stops a, a woman from ovulating so that the egg and the sperm don't meet each other. And the reason it's important is because at least 20% of women who use emergency contraception do so after non-consensual sex. And so the question is, again, do you want them to at least know what it is and to be prepared just in case? There's very limited research about the best way to teach your child to keep themselves safe sexually, but essentially, it's about behavioral modification. You don't necessarily have to explain things way too much about the fact that people are predatory and things like that, but I would break it down into very concrete steps. Step one is they need to be able to identify an unsafe situation. Someone is touching my private area, that's not supposed to happen. You know, so just being able to identify that. Step two is actually leaving that situation, knowing how they can make their exit. And then step three is being able to tell an adult what happened. These are the very specific skills that your kids should be able to do. And it's, it's hard to do it. It's hard to do it. In my experience, the best way to teach it is role play. So that you as a parent actually present them with hypothetical situations and talk about what could you do in that situation and talk it through. 
and have them practice and actually use the words with you. You know, and I think that in, in studies, that seems to be what works the best. And just in practice, I haven't studied this, but just in practice, talking to the families I work with, this also seems to be what works the best. When it comes to fertility and legacy, I think you should ask your kids if they've ever thought about whether they want to have kids. Just know what's in their heads. You know, just know what's on their mind. Because once you have a sense of whether this is something they're actually thinking about, they won't all be thinking about this, but some of them will, then I think you can have more realistic conversations with them about their ability to raise a family, what it actually takes to be a parent, and whether they're ready for that. And, and also, you know, with a health condition, it's important to talk about the risk of transmission to their child. So if somebody with Jacobson syndrome has a child, there's a 50% chance that their child is also going to have Jacobson syndrome. So I think that kind of explaining that to them, all those aspects of it, these might not be things they've thought of before. Raise the subject. And I, I think presenting alternatives for how your child can leave a legacy. You know, what, what else can you be known for, you know, even if you don't have children? I think that that's an important conversation to have. Okay, guys, we're at the end of our hour. I know there was a lot of doom and gloom, but I'm hoping that there's also some hope with all of this, that if you're thinking about this stuff in advance, you can be prepared. So the conclusions I just want to summarize with is just recognize what specific considerations for puberty you need to think about if your child has Jacobson syndrome in terms of like height and pubertal development and timing of puberty. Acknowledge that your child will have a sexual identity so that you can control the conversation. Proactively talk to them about what to expect with puberty and body changes, healthy sexuality and reproductive health screening. Make your doctor talk to you and educate you and your child. Your periods don't have to interfere with your quality of life. There is hope. And lay the groundwork for your child's sexual safety. Just a couple books I want to mention, um, just in case they're of interest to you. The one on the right, easy for you to say, is uh, actually this is a doctor that, who trained me when I was doing my fellowship. And she wrote this book for teenagers living with chronic health conditions or physical or intellectual disabilities. It's not just about sex. It talks about friendships, school, substance use, um, just a lot of different kind of growing up kinds of topics. And it, it has a lot of great sort of like question and answer format um, from real questions she's received from, from patients who have chronic health conditions. It's a great book. Um, she's written a few other books, but this one I think is probably most direct to topic. And this other book called I Said No is actually a really nice, it's, it's a kid's book. But it's, it, like I said, it's never too early to start learning with this. Um, that that kind of talks about how you can, like some examples of things you can say to identify if a situation is unsafe and how you can leave that situation. And also kind of mutual respect, respecting each other's personal space, how to kind of establish boundaries with the people in your life. So I, th I think it's a really good book. Thanks so much, guys. That's it for me. But I'll stick around if people have any questions about anything. Are there any questions? Oh my God, everyone just looks so terrified. <laughs> it's not so bad. Oh, I'm sorry, let me, uh, ah, hang on one sec. Can you tell I, I, I don't have a Mac? <laughs> oh, you still can say, okay, hang on. Is that better? Yeah. basically worry too much beforehand, before you know what's going to be happening. Um, about how long should you wait until you decide to get some sort of treatment? For, you're talking about for heavy for periods girl, specifically? Yeah. Absolutely. So I think it's important to keep in mind that it can take two to five years for your periods to become adult type periods. Many girls don't start ovulating right away. On average, it takes about two years. However, 
many kids will still have very heavy periods right from the get-go, especially if you have a bleeding disorder. So yeah, I mean, if your kid has a bleeding disorder, chances are the very first period is going to be very heavy. It may not be painful, it may not, in fact, it may not be painful at all, but it might be very, very heavy. So if the period starts and you are noticing, even that very first period, we're having to change her pad every hour or two, she, man, she's going through like 10 pads a day, you know, like I would actually not give it too long. You know, I would start by taking her to your primary care doctor. If, if she's had two or three days of heavy bleeding, I would probably get them to check a hemoglobin, just really simple, just like a finger poke in their office. If her hemoglobin is low, then you definitely want to have a lower index for starting treatment like now. You know what I mean? If the period starts and it, it's not necessarily heavy and it's not necessarily prolonged and the hemoglobin's okay, I, I think it's okay to wait a bit. You know, and I, I think the time to intervene is definitely as soon as your quality of life is being impacted. Um, and certainly be mindful that if that first period is heavy, you know, I wouldn't even necessarily wait out the whole week. I mean, if it's been a couple days and this bleeding is really heavy, you know, I would, I would probably get them assessed by their physician. Yeah. Yeah, no worries. Hi. Hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, I don't know if you'll know the answer, if you've discussed it with anyone, but there's been some concern in the past or brought up about brain aneurysms and birth control. Mm. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I can, I can speak to that for sure. So um, the issue is actually less with aneurysms and more with stroke. So that, that's typically, you know, what, what the concern is. Um, yeah, and so there is a very, very small risk of blood clots, whether that's blood clots in like your legs or arms or a stroke or in your chest, like a pulmonary embolism, things like that, when you start any kind of medicine that contains estrogen. Now, typically, before you start estrogen-containing medicine for anyone, you should screen them to find out if they have a personal or family history of strokes, deep vein thromboses, like clots in your legs or your arms, or lung clots, like pulmonary embolus. If that kid has ever actually had one of these things before, they should never, ever, ever, ever start on estrogen-containing contraception. If there's a family history, like if their mother or their father or a sibling has had those things, there's a workup you can do to determine whether they're prone to clotting more easily. But if you have a kid who doesn't have a personal or family history, the odds that they're going to have a blood clot, like just in general, like you and I, if we don't have that history, our risk of getting a clot, even if we're on nothing, is 10 in 100,000. If you start birth control, it increases to 30 in 100,000. So is it an increase? Yes. Is it a large increase? Relatively speaking, not really. It's, I think that's like 0.3%, something like that. So anybody with a pre-existing you know, disposition to clotting should, should not take estrogen-containing contraception due to the risk of stroke. But if you don't have an underlying condition, even though, yes, there's a relative increase, it's actually it's, it's considered far lower than the potential benefit of the medication. And I would add that if you get pregnant, it increases to 60 in 100,000. You know, so just to put it all in perspective. And are all of the birth control methods that were listed, are they all estrogen containing? No, that no, that's a great question. <laughs> okay. So the, the pill and the patch and the vaginal ring all have estrogen. But if somebody has a medical reason why they shouldn't take estrogen, then the shot in the intrauterine device do not have estrogen and they are perfectly safe to use even if you have a pre-existing condition. I also wanted to say thank you. This was extremely informative okay. and well organized. Thank I appreciate you. it. I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. We have a questions? question on the stream. Uh, Marie at says, uh, with hypogonadism, is there a treatment or is it permanent? Dylan had to have induced puberty with testosterone treatment, and he has hypogonadism. He is now 16 years old. So I, I just want to make sure I have the question correct. The question is, is hypogonadism reversible? Is that right? Yeah, is there a treatment or is it permanent? That's a good question. It depends a little bit on the cause of the hypogonadism. So one thing that is, from my reading, that's thought to be at play in Jacobson syndrome is that your pituitary gland, which is a gland in your brain that produces hormones, may not function as well. 
That gland is the one that's responsible for making thyroid hormone, for making growth hormone, and for making sex hormones. So there's a reason why those are the hormones that seem to all be, you know, affected with Jacobson syndrome is they've isolated it to this one gland that may or may not function correctly. So if the problem is an issue in the gland where it can't produce normal sex hormones, that may not be a reversible condition. If the issue is someone has hypogonadism because they have thyroid disease or something like that and you can treat the thyroid disease, then it may be reversible. So I would say if somebody has hypogonadism, hypogonadism is sort of like a symptom. It's like if I say I have a fever, there could be many things that cause my fever. In the same way, there could be many things that cause hypogonadism, right? So I think the, the cause of the hypogonadism needs to be elucidated and it may be reversible, but I have to tell you that the odds are it's, it, it may not be reversible. Now, I would also say that hypogonadism and undescended testicles are not one and the same. Somebody might have normal sex hormone production, but they have undescended testicles. So for them, they need surgical correction of their undescended testicles, and then they need to learn about self-testicular exam and stuff. But their sex hormones are going to work just fine. They're not going to have hypogonadism. But if you have hypogonadism, you may also then have undescended testicles, as well as other problems and the underlying issue may or may not be fixable. So unfortunately, it's a, it kind of depends on the kid. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you so much. Um, sorry, uh, Marie just oh. uh, updated. She says uh, he's had both testes corrected for undescended testicles. I'm, I'm sorry, could you, could you say that again? Uh, Marie says that he's had both testes corrected for undescended testicles. Okay, so if he's had both testes corrected, then I, I think the, the key question now is, is his body making testosterone? You know, so that, that would be the question to check with his doctor. Um, because at 16, he should have had some testicular development by now. Usually the latest that occurs is 14. So if she hasn't noticed any testicular development yet, there may be underlying hypogonadism that has not been fixed, and she should probably go to her doctor and get some blood work done for her son. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. There you go. We oh. have a little bag made by the kids in the south. Oh, well, wow. that's cool. Card and Thank you. Oh, oh. hello. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank, Thank you so much. That. We appreciate Thank you. coming. Yeah.